Welcome to chapter 13, Entering Foreign Markets. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about how domestic companies can enter into foreign markets. Um, so a big decision has to be made. Which foreign markets should a company enter and when to enter them and on what scale? Um, and there's a choice of entry mode. Uh, any firm thinking about uh, moving into a foreign market must struggle with these issues um, because foreign markets are a much more difficult strategy and to implement successfully for a lot of domestic countries. And they have a lot of options as far as the timing and scale and what, me what business methodology they'll use uh, to enter new markets. But it's going to be driven by hopefully long-term growth and profit potential. Um, so let's see here. This how on the slide, how can firms enter foreign markets? <clears throat> and of course, we have uh, options include just straight exporting, where the country has really no presence in the foreign market, just exports their products there. Licensing, franchising, um, joint ventures, so those are just to name a few. I'm going to go over those thoroughly in this chapter. And there's, you know, of course, companies, when deciding upon how to do this, they have to look at the transpa uh, transportation costs, uh, trade barriers, political, economic risks, and overall how it fits the firm strategy. Pretty much common sense. Um, and but like I was talking about before, you know, or entry decisions, we're talking which foreign market to enter, the scale of entry, which means, you know, how big uh, will you try to enter the market and uh, how fast, and then your mode for entry. And these we'll talk about more in this chapter as well. So a big question that we want to answer is, <clears throat> you know, if you're a company, a domestic company, and you want to enter a foreign market, what market would you choose? And there's over 200 nations in the world that have a significant market, um, you know, but they don't hold the same profit potential for a firm um, thinking about expanding. You know, some countries um, have a lot more opportunities and a potential for growth and profits, and some countries don't. You know, for example, um, Germany, United States, France, India, Brazil, China, these are all countries with a, a huge potential and uh, a lot of money for consumers to spend. Some other countries that are much smaller or have a much poorer demographic may not be as, as, um, as profitable to enter. So these are things that, you know, depending on your product, if your product is Coca-Cola, then most countries and citizens of most countries can afford that. If your product is uh, high-end computers, there's only going to be a select few markets that can really support that. You know, ultimately, the, cho the choice must be based on an assessment of the foreign market's long-run profit potential. Uh, and a lot of companies moved into China early, s seeing that in the long run, this is going to be a huge market, and they wanted to get in and establish their presence, even if it meant taking a loss uh, initially. Um, and there, I mean, there's, there's many factors to look at that we, you know, that we've studied in previous chapters about economic and political factors, of course, uh, cultural factors that we talked about. Um, and we're going to balance those with, you know, the costs and risk associated with doing business in a particular country. In previous chapters, we looked at long run economic be benefits of doing business in a, in a, in a country. Um, and they're a function of uh, factors such as the size of the market, the demographics, the, the, the wealth of its purchasing power of its citizens uh, in, the, in the market. Uh, the future wealth of and potential for the country and its citizens is another uh, key statistic to think about. And economic growth rates. Um, you know, so some, some markets like China, India, and Indonesia have very big uh, consumer bases. Uh, and they, uh, but you have to look at living standards and economic growth. So uh, India and China are still relatively very poor, but they're growing rapidly. So it's an attractive market to get in early and establish a brand. Um, there is weaker growth in Indonesia, 
Um, so that might be a less attractive country, but there's still uh, p plenty of potential for relocating in, into that foreign market. Um, so you would have to really judge what is the, co the country's capacity for growth. Uh, what's the um, current trend for its political system? Uh, the location of the country as far as location of your assets and potential for uh, getting there and doing business and establishing a foothold. <clears throat> now, uh, the, the, the countries that have larger populations uh, are economically advanced and politically stable uh, and have democracies, generally attract a lot of uh, foreign uh, investment from companies wanting to establish a business there. The uh, United States is one such example where many foreign companies wish to establish uh, a presence here and conduct business, although the United States is also a highly competitive marketplace. So some businesses choose to stay away because they know they just can't compete uh, in this marketplace because um, it's highly competitive. You know, even in, if you look in um, certain uh, um, industries, they just, like the auto industry, it's very difficult for some foreign manufacturers to sell cars and establish a presence in the United States. Uh, it was only recently that the Italian automotive company, uh, Fiat, is recently selling cars in the United States again, and that's because they're of their uh, merger slash acquisition with Chrysler. But there are French um, automobile manufacturers, Indian, Russian, but they do not sell to the United States because the market is just too competitive. You know. Um, So another important factor is the value of an international business that international business can create in a foreign market. And this depends on the suitability of the product offering that the market and nature of the competition. So it, like I was saying with the auto industry, if the competition is too great, you know, you have nine of the world's strongest automobile companies already operating and competing here. Uh, what chance do you have if you're a foreign auto manufacturer to, do, to also compete? Um, so that's other considerations that you definitely would want to think about. Okay, next slide. Timing of entry. Okay, so uh, um, once you figure out where you want your company to expand to, it's important to think about the timing of the entry. Um, you know, an early entry into an international business um, market or foreign market. Uh, before other com companies get there, uh, can have some advantages. Um, and if you come in late after everybody else is established, that could have some definite disadvantages. So the advantages frequently associated with uh, entering a market earlier, commonly known as the first mover advantages. And this is with something we definitely talked about in the strategic management course and a little bit in this course, a little bit in some earlier chapters. And the first mover advantage is the ability to preempt rivals and capture demand by establishing a strong brand uh, name ahead of everybody else. And desire has driven the rapid expansion of many comp companies into developing nations where there isn't really much profit to be had yet, but they still want to get the advantage, a first mover advantage for when the, com the country does become more successful. And a good, a good, two good companies to look at here are Coke and Pepsi. If Coke or Pepsi gets into a country first and establishes themselves and their brand name, they can dominate up to 60 to 90 percent of the marketplace uh, before Pepsi uh, enters. So if Coke, say Coke establishes itself in a country like Iraq and then Pepsi comes later, uh, Coke may have already locked down 90 percent. And these companies are so good with their marketing and to lo lock in people into loyalty that People are often very um, takes a lot for them to change, and you, and you may think think of yourself here. Are you a Coke person or a Pepsi person? And what would it take for you to consistently buy the other brand? Would you be you know? And and I saw this firsthand when we used to be a Coca Cola campus here at Stony Brook, and then we switched over to Pepsi. And oh my God, the outroar and the outcry and and the strikes and the, and the picketing and the you know. Um, demonstrations over it. It was, you know, you, you think that we were, 
you know, switching political systems or some or some uh, or something like that. It was sort of um, instead of the spring awakening, it was like the cola wars awakening on campus. And for me, I could care less. Coke, Pepsi, who cares? It's all soda. It's all bad for you. You shouldn't be drinking it anyway. You know. But a lot of people haven't evolved their uh, awareness of corporate brainwashing to really say who gives a shit whether it's Coke or Pepsi. You know. Um, it's really not that important. It's not something to really uh, get upset over, you know. But that's the power of the brainwashing, advertising and media abilities that these companies have. And that's why the first mover advantage is so powerful. Uh, I mean, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken have established themselves early in many countries and really developed a strong following uh, because of this branding um, to their consumers, and when other, uh, and if you think of say uh, the Long Island uh, fast food market, it's very difficult for new fast food companies to compete here on a large scale because there's so many uh, companies already entrenched and already doing so well, and people have their loyalties to McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, what have you, uh, that a lot of other na uh, national fast food franchises like Carl's Jr., Hardee's, um, just to name a couple, uh, Roy Rogers, uh, they either left this market or refused to enter because it's just really not that much of an upside. They're better off uh, building their brand elsewhere. Uh, recently, we had, uh, 10 years ago, Krispy Kreme was trying to establish a foothold in Long Island, and it just um, was not able to really become successful because of the first mover advantage that's that Dunkin' Donuts had uh, in the marketplace, and it really they couldn't generate a significant amount of demand for their uh, donuts to survive. All right. So you know, so there can be disadvantages associated with entering foreign markets before other uh, businesses as well, uh, and they're often refer you know referred to, of course, as first mover disadvantages, and the disadvantages may uh, give rise to pioneering costs. You know. Move up the slides. I gotta. Okay, so costs that uh, an early entry has to bear that a later entry can avoid. So pioneering costs arise when businesses, when business systems in a foreign country are so different from that of a of a home country market that the company has to devote considerable amount of time and effort and expense to learn the rules of the game and the pioneering costs. Uh, biz, you know can result in you know, even failure for the firm due to the ignorance of the foreign environment, culture, you know, and they can make some really big mistakes that uh, the first mover may make all these mistakes and then even withdraw in certain respects. Even Wal uh, Walmart has done this. We learned earlier in the earlier chapters when they tried to move into Germany. Uh, and then uh, a later company like Target may learn from those mistakes and move in and do even better. Um, so there, there's a certain liability with being the first uh, foreign uh, competitor in a market. Uh, you know, there's a lot to learn, and I mean, it could have. It's a risk, so they could pay off big, or the pioneering costs can really, you know, uh, have an effect. Now, remember, take an idea on something like coffee. In China and even India, coffee is not a big drink. However, the pioneering cost that Starbucks has endured in promoting and establishing this product offering of coffees and educating the consumers to drink coffee and like coffee beverages, um, you know, the, even the cost of this education and free samples and promotions and advertising, you know, it's significant um, uh, amount of money has to be spent in promoting unfamiliar products to customers. You know, the same thing with certain fast food country companies. If they're trying to introduce new types of food, uh, it's also a difficult and expensive investment to make because you know you're investing in learning uh, and customer education by um, moving in first and trying to get them to uh, like your product. You know, and in, in many cases, whether you know, with anything new to a foreign market, which may seem silly to us, so we're so used to it. Um, can take a lot to get the domestic population to want to work with and utilize the products. Um, you know, like I was talking about before, KFC 
uh, introduced the Chinese to American style fast food. And then later McDonald's came into the market and they built off of what KSD has established in China. Uh, so an early entry can, can have some disadvantages uh, relative compared to someone who comes in after them. You know, for example, if Starbucks comes into China and establishes uh, a strong desire for drinking coffee, then Dunkin' Donuts can follow with a much less, much smaller uh, budget in advertising and promotion because the country is very familiar with the product. Um, so pretty, I mean, com common sense here, but something that companies have to think about. Now, we talk about the scale of entry uh, and, you know, how big should we make it? Um, so, you know, entering a market on a large scale involves a huge commitment, a huge amount of resources and money, um, and a huge risk. Um, so, and generally a large scale uh, involvement is going to be a rapid entry. Um, you know, so if a con if you they want to establish if a company wants to come into the United States and they want to establish it in all 50 states, that's going to be a pretty large entry and a pretty significant investment to do that. You know, uh, let's see, a bank like TD Bank is a Canadian bank, and they purchased some local banks and established uh, started establishing a, a a pretty sizable entry into the banking market of New York and Long Island, and you see these TD banks popping ev up everywhere. And I think they purchased Commercial Bank uh, or Commerce One, I think maybe that was it, or Commerce Bank, something like that. And they moved in pretty significantly in the area because they know that in some businesses you need to have a lot of locations. So a bank doesn't work well with one location or two locations. So a bank. Uh, makes more profit and attracts more members if they see the bank everywhere. So if you're going to choose a bank, you're going to look around and say, oh, I see the two banks I see everywhere are TD Bank and Chase Bank. So I'm going to choose one of those two because I want a bank where there's a, red, there's a lot of ATMs available no matter where I go and, you know, I have an ease um, of banking. You know, but if you do enter a market in a very significant scale, uh, a rapid entry, um, that is going to be result going to demand some rather um, large uh, strategic commitments. Um, a, strategic, a strategic commitment has a long term impact and is, a, and is difficult to reverse. So deciding to enter a market on a significant scale, you know, is, is going to you know is going to take some sticking power because you may not make money right away. So can a company afford to be in that market? Uh, for five or ten years at a loss before they make a significant profit. Um, uh, so other things to think about. Um, so let's see. Now a small scale entry, of course, you know, is another um, another option. A small scale entry allows for a firm to learn about the foreign market while limiting the exposure in the market. So sort of just tipping your toe in the water, just check the temperature. And a small, a small scale entry is a way to gather information about a foreign market before deciding whether to enter on a significant scale. So you could really uh, make a smaller commitment and if you have the time, if there's no competitors really breathing down your neck, this may be the better way of going. Because you can collect information, uh, reduces the risks, um, and it can establish a good strong network for a larger scale um, entry later on. Uh, and if it's if and if it's if you're the first mover, a smaller scale entry may be better than a larger scale because if there are mistakes made or it turns out not to be the right market, you wouldn't have wasted too much money. And in a smaller scale, you have more time to develop and understand the local culture, the local pol politics, and red tape before you um, move in on, on a large, large scale. Uh, okay. So. All right. So in summary there, there's no one blueprint on how to enter a foreign market. Uh, it's different with every different country and different company and, and different competitive landscape of each market. So they need to learn from the experience and learn from their competitors before they jump into a market too quickly. Now, um, as an example, um, 
there is a fast food um, company that uh, is from the Philippines, and I, I, you may know it for uh, it's called Jollibee, and they were a local fast food franchise in the Philippines. So uh, Jollibee was enjoying some success in the Philippines, and then McDonald's moves in, and McDonald's is expanding into the Philippines. So. Uh, everybody feared the worst and figured that McDonald's would just roll over Jollibee as a local competitor. However, Jollibee um, took the opportunity to really learn and observe what McDonald's was doing and how they did a, a strategic launch in a foreign country, looked at um, McDonald's strengths and operations and uniformity and, and cleanliness and adopted, uh, so it took the best parts of McDonald's into its corporate culture. Uh, but saw a weakness in McDonald's and saw that McDonald's was slow to react to international tastes or international markets. And in the Philippines, they had definitely have some more um, different tastes than what McDonald's usually serves, which, such as their, um, their love for, um, the, uh, I guess, mango is a big taste they like, uh, a sweeter type of hamburger different spices, uh, dishes that include rice and, and maybe pineapples. So they had a more local flavor. Now, after uh, Jollibee had learned a lot from McDonald's entering the Philippines, Jollibee went international. And not only did they succeed in, con in uh, beating McDonald's in the Philippines as far as sales and, and market penetration, they're also, also able to um, export their fast food franchise to many other uh, Asian and Pacific nations, uh, and even back into the United States. Well, they have a smaller presence in the United States, mostly in California, but they, for a small local franchise, they learned well by McDonald's successes and mistakes and were able to create, you know, a, a franchise that was, you know, extremely strong. And I, I think they're in, they're almost a hundred nations today. Um, and they uh, have started to move aggressively into China. And I would really, now Jollibee is an example of a fast food company that wouldn't move into Long Island too quickly because of the um, extreme competitive marketplace for fast food on Long Island and also because of sort of um, the tastes aren't particularly aligned with uh, the Jollibee offerings. So it would be a significant uh, risk for them to move into this marketplace. However, one benefit for fast food companies is that demographically, and I was just reading this in the news today, um, that f the fast food industry, although many people think are saturated, uh, is actually, there's room for growth because more and more middle class are comfortable with fast food and eating out in fast food more often. So there is still plenty of room for growth in the fast food industry as more and more people eat more and more meals at fast food companies um, on a weekly basis. And one of the things sort of fueling the growth of fast food companies is that they've been adapting healthier uh, menu items so that they're erasing some of the guilt parents have for bringing their children there, uh, such as McDonald's offering salads, apple slices, um, oatmeal and, uh, and other less uh, toxic foods so that people who are health conscious can also um, come in uh, to fast food and not feel so like they're ruining their health by doing so. Another thing changing the health food market also that international um, franchises have to be aware of that in the United States we're often a pioneer of health. So the United States uh, was the first country to really be big into physical fitness. We developed the running shoe. We developed um, the franchise gym. Uh, and a higher percentage of Americans go to um, jo uh, jo uh, belong to a gym and do, um, you know, uh, f uh, frequent visits. So we pioneer a lot of the health food, the health food trends, the vitamin stores. So the United States has always been on the forefront on – uh, healthy consumer products, attitudes, and exercise. Now, it's not to say that we're the healthiest nation on earth. That is, of course, not the, not the case. But we do pioneer a lot of the health-conscious and oriented uh, products in the world. Uh, now, one result of that has been 
uh, a requirement, especially in New York State, of restaurants to have to list their calories and nutritional contents on their menus and menu boards of any type of franchise uh, or food company with more than X amount of locations. Uh, I'm not sure how many. So that, that forces these companies like, you know, you look at Applebee's or Friday's or, um, uh, or, any of the, or any of those fast, um, not fast food, sort of casual dining franchises to rethink their menu and make more options that are healthier because now people can really see the amount of fat, sodium, and calories that they're buying in their dinners. So there's been a big change. So um, a foreign company coming into the Long Island area may not understand these particular uh, menu requirements, and they may have a hard time with that. Okay. Now let's talk about some entry modes. So we're going to specifically talk about different ways to get into a foreign market. And we have exporting, turnkey, licensing, franchising, joint ventures, and wholly owned subsidiaries. So let's kind of talk about what each of these means. The easiest of all of these is exporting. And this is basically just taking your products, pr producing them domestically, shipping them to an international um, distributor or just directly to customers in foreign countries. So you could just start taking orders, put up a website, start taking orders in the European Union and then ship your products over to the European Union. But there are there's a lot to learn about selling in different markets, such as VAT, value added tax, and different regulations and abiding by tariffs. And there's a whole new um, amount of red tape and paperwork that comes with exporting. You know, uh, now the advantages to exporting is it is the lowest cost option. So because you're not establishing any brick and mortar or any employees in the foreign country, so you can get it's the fastest way to get your products into an international market. Um, now it's it can it's sometimes not attractive when the cost of manufacturing um, is very high, or the transportation costs are very high. You know, for example, a product like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, you don't want to bottle that and make it in the United States. It's a heavy product and then ship it internationally. You want to develop a manufacturing because of the high um, transportation costs, you want to develop a bottling location in a foreign country and, and make and bottle the soda there directly. You know, if the tariff barriers are very high and, and you can't export to that country without having your price of your product doubled or tripl tripled by ex tariff barriers, then you may want to have a local presence. I know a lot of companies that developed uh, a regional uh, division in Ireland so they could escape a lot of the EU tariffs since Ireland was an EU member and if you had a business operating in the EU it would escape a lot of those t uh, tariffs and other barriers. Um, and if you have, if you're, if you can't really control your foreign distribution or your foreign representation, who's selling your products, uh, products internationally, and you can't trust them or they're not operating your best interest, then you need to establish more than an exporting presence in that country. Let's look at a turnkey uh, projects. Now this is sort of, um, there are companies that specialize in the design, construction, and startup of. Uh, turnkey plants uh, that are common in certain type of industries. In a turnkey project, the, um, the contractor agrees to handle every detail of the project uh, from the direct client introducing um, the training of the operating personnel, uh, completion of the contract, you know, the foreign cl uh, clients. It's this completely turnkey type of operation where uh, you're hiring an expert in that foreign market to, who will come and say, okay, I know everything about this country, and I'm gonna. I can set up a turnkey project for you where you pay me, and I'm gonna set up everything for you. And um, this, you know, basically is a great way of, um, of avoiding the pitfalls of learning all everything it takes to put together, you know, the technology and, and assembly plants and and you know everything necessary. Uh, to get started in the, in the foreign country. So a turnkey project would really be, you know, somebody else, another company handling the establishment of your introduction into that foreign market, specifically more on the manufacturing side. Okay. Um, 
and you're you're really the big advantage here is that you're working on the expertise of this person in that foreign country and you have less risk um, now it may not be attractive if your country if your company has specific technological advantages or patents that you don't want um, all other companies to get a hold of that could possibly you know sell them illegally to other people now there's also licensing so this what you do here is you grant uh, somebody else a license um, to, to sell your property so for example licensing is very big in the movie or uh, superhero or character driven uh, businesses where you can license uh, say for example you have Marvel Entertainment which is owned by Disney but before Disney bought Marvel Entertainment they licensed um, their characters to other movie studios so they licensed Spider-Man to Sony the X-Men to uh, 20th Century Fox Fantastic Four to 20th Century Fox Blade to New Line Cinemas um, as some examples uh, now at the time the licensing made sense because Marvel didn't have their own studio so in order to get these movies made it was easier to license that property to somebody else for money and then they would get you know and they also licensed things like you know dolls and at well I should say action figures and peanut butter and clothes and pajamas and things like that now when we're talking international markets uh, and you want to you know say you have a soda brand that you want to sell uh, in another market you can license the right to sell your products to another distributor and they will help you and use their facilities to enter into a market and turn and you receive a royalty so um, so if you weren't a big enough company to really establish a foreign market uh, it may make sense to license your products to somebody who can easily manufacture them and sell them and then you get a royalty fee um, so you don't really bear any risk in the development costs associated with operating the foreign market you would you would avoid the barriers to investment uh, in some cases a lot of trade barriers um, so licensing could be you know definitely um, a good thing and, and generally involves inventions and patents and processes and copyrights and trademarks where uh, licensing makes the most sense okay. it can be unattractive when a firm um, when you don't have really tight control over the marketing or manufacturing or strategy um, of your product so that could be something that you should really consider strongly um, it, you're going to lose your ability you, when you license the product out you lose certain control over it and you lose your ability to um, uh, employ strategic uh, moves that you may want to make when entering into a competitive market um, so you know for you know for example if going back to that Marvel example they have you know Marvel's making a new Avengers movie and they want to use two characters the Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver who are considered possibly considered X-Men or mutants so they have you know an issue now did we license these out to Fox are they part of the X-Men family or can we utilize them for the new Avengers movie so now they have a licensing issue where you know there it could be in dispute of uh, being able to utilize their own properties to to, uh, to make additional money. So if you license your product out to a foreign, to um, usually this deals with contracts, a number of years of contracts, it's going to prevent you from operating directly in that foreign market until your licensees agreements have expired. Okay. Now let's move on to franchising. And most people are familiar with franchising. And uh, franchising is similar to licensing. Although the franchising tends to involve longer term commitments than licensing. So licensing can be three to five years, you know, but franchising is basically a special form of licensing in which the franchiser uh, not only sells the intangible property, trademarks and formulas and recipes uh, to the franchisee, but also insists that the franchisee agree to abide by strict rules to how it does business. Um, and the most famous franchisee is McDonald's. So the franchiser will, um, I, I'm sorry, the most famous franchiser is McDonald's. 
a franchisee is the person buying the franchise or the business. Uh, so the franchisor will, will also often assist the franchisee in running the business on an ongoing basis. Uh, uh, as with licensing, the franchisor typically receives royalty payments, which amounts to some percentage of the franchisee's revenues and sales. Whereas franchising is um, pursued primarily by manufacturing firms, franchising is, is primarily a, a, a modality for service firms. And McDonald's is a really great example of franchisors because they really developed one of the best franchising models. So now this is how it works with McDonald's. Um, you buy a McDonald's franchise and you get the cooking methods, the staffing policies, design locations, trademarks, equipment, uh, everything you need to run your McDonald's. Now McDonald's is a type of business that very rarely fails. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like a press that prints, you know, sort of like a machine that turns out gold. It's just a gold mine. Uh, now, McDonald's realizing that they have such a successful store, they demand a lot from their franchisees. So the franchisees have to buy everything from McDonald's, from the ingredients to their food, to their machinery, to their uniforms, to their fixtures in, uh, of their restaurant and signs. And so McDonald's makes a lot of money, not just from the sales of burgers and fries from these local those locations, but from the selling of everything else that goes into the location. All the materials and, um, and foodstuffs come directly from McDonald's. So all the hamburgers and onions and pickles and uh, buns and everything, McDonald's sells. So they make a stream of money from the inventory and, and equipment they sell to franchisees, plus they take a percentage of the sales. Now, you might be... Um, you might say, well, this isn't fair. McDonald's is taking too much. But you know what? When your McDonald's franchise generates three to five million dollars worth of profits for you a year after paying McDonald's its share, there's really not much to complain about. And that's one of the reasons they've been so successful. So, you know, of course, the advantages of franchising is an entry mode um, are very similar to those to licensing, as we talked about before. Um, but the firm receives many of the costs and risks of opening in the foreign market um, on its own. Instead, by, fran by franchising, um, the franchisees will assume those costs and risks. So McDonald's Corporation, you know, even if, if they opened 100 new McDonald's to, and sold them to franchisees in a foreign country and they all failed, McDonald's would still walk away making profits. Uh, so there's a no-lose. McDonald's can't lose. Um, only the franchisee generally can lose, you know, uh, in expanding into riskier locations. Um, now, the disadvantage is that you're sharing the profits with somebody else. So, you know, if McDonald's owned every location around the world themselves, they'd be a much more profitable company. However, they don't. So they're sharing in the profits of McDonald's with all their franchisees. And now, one of the reasons, though, McDonald's was able to expand so quickly and have so many thousands of restaurants around the world was because the franchise model uh, made gave them access to a lot of capital as their franchisees brought the capital to the business. And, you know, if you have a very inexpensive franchise, like I think Subway is one of the more inexpensive franchises, you can really greatly expand because it opens up the potential to many more people who can now actually franchise because the, the entry points are so much less. You know, right now as it stands today, if you want a franchise, if you want a McDonald's franchise, you better have restaurant experience, a couple million dollars of net worth, and uh, I don't even think they let you franchise a new McDonald's unless you're currently owning and operating successfully a, a McDonald's already. So it's a pretty exclusive club. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next. Oh, and here's a slide of McDonald's in all the different locations uh, around the world. I couldn't tell you where these locations are. Some of them look like in the Middle East, Far East. Um, maybe that last one is in Russia. I don't know. But you get the picture. They're all over. Let's talk about joint ventures. So a joint venture entails establishing a firm uh, that is jointly owned by two or more independent firms. So for example, um, take a company like Fuji Xerox is a joint venture between Xerox and Fuji Photo. 
Uh, so establishing a joint venture has long been a popular mode of entry into new markets. You know, GM used uh, this this mode of entry to get into China, as a lot of companies had done, where a joint venture would be 50-50. Uh, often can be 50-50, but it can be really any percentage between two different companies who want to come together and create a joint venture, which is a separate company. You know, you could, you know, there's the two parent companies and they create a joint venture, which is generally a separate company, like a subsidiary of the two companies. Uh, and again, the advantages here is you have a benefit of a local partner who can cut through the red tape and understands the culture and language and political system, business systems of a foreign country, and you're splitting the costs. Uh, with a partner, and it can help avoid the risk of um, not being supported by a foreign government. So a lot of times, if you're a far, if you're a Chinese company trying to buy and establish your own uh, division in the United States, you may come up against a lot of um, political uh, roadblocks. But if you join a create a joint venture with another American company, then those roadblocks sort of disappear. Uh, so joint ventures are very pe um, popular uh, mode of entry for expanding internationally. But you know, this advantage is that you have to work with another company and you have to come together and agree on things and you, you don't have as much, you don't have total control um, and you're, you're sharing the profits with them as well. Um, and you do run the risk, especially for a lot of American manufacturers establishing joint ventures in the developing world, you have the risk of losing control of your technology and that your partner taking your technology and developing their own competing business against you. So it's very difficult uh, for some, some companies to really form a joint venture because the technology is just too beneficial uh, and too powerful to really let slip into somebody else's hands. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about wholly owned subsidiaries. Um, so in a wholly owned subsidiary, the firm owns 100% of the stock. Establishing a wholly owned subsidiary in a foreign market can be done in two ways. The firm can either set up a new operation in that country, uh, often referred to as a greenfield venture, or it can acquire an established firm in a host nation and use that firm to promote its products. Um, you know, so those are really two ways of doing it now. They do reduce the risk because you're not going to lose control of your core competencies because you're a 100% owner here. And you can have tighter controls over your operations in different countries um, and, and deploy more strategic coordination among those different countries. Um, and you could utilize uh, a lot more by sort of, in some cases, purchasing a wholly owned subsidiary or creating a wholly owned subsidiary um, they're sort of a separate company and they're going to be bear the full costs of risks of set up in overseas operations. So, you know, it can be easily broken out and established as, as a different company, even though it's within the same family. Uh, but it's generally a more costly mef method to move into a foreign market. Um, from a capital investment standpoint, and firms doing this must bear, um, you know, the full costs and risks of setting up an overseas operation um, on the total books of, of the full company's operations, even though it's a separate sort of modality. Okay. So how do you choose a specific, a specific entry mode? Uh, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages as we sort of went through. Um, so it involves trade-offs. So you really have to decide um, which of these modalities will work best for you. Uh, and, and it depends on your core competencies. Is your company more of a technology know-how or more management know-how? That's going to help decide on your entry point. So if your, comp your company is more technology-based, say like an Apple um, or a computer or a semiconductor, and technology is really um, your strong suit, you should really avoid licenses and joint ventures um, and you want to um, minimize the risk of losing control of your technology. So you want to choose a mode of entry where you have total control over your technology and know-how and it doesn't get shared or stolen too easily from somebody from a competitor. Um, management know-how. If you're the a type of company that has great management know-how, 
um, like a service-based company, then international trademark laws are generally effective for protecting your management know-how, and you can you can easily move into those countries with uh, a franchise or joint venture, um, and get a greater use of your brand your brand names in, in a quicker establishment and, and deployment. Um, of your products or businesses internationally, sort of like McDonald's. Um, now, if your firm faces strong pressure of cost reductions, um, you may be pursuing some combination of exporting and wholly owned subsidiaries um, to achieve the location and scale of economies and retain some degree of control over your worldwide manufacturing distribution. You may have to have a hybrid tailored approach um, to fit your company's best needs. Uh, you know, you may ask the question, greenfield or acquisition? So should you own, should you create a wholly owned subsidiary in a country by building a subsidiary from the ground up, the greenfield strategy, or just acquire another business in a target market uh, and as an acquisition strategy? Um, and that's actually acquisition strategy is a little bit faster because you're acquiring already uh, a fully operating functional company that you're going to move into, continue selling what their products are, but also introduce and sell your products through them as well. Uh, and that's been acquisitions, I think, have been mergers and acquisitions have been a much more common than the green hill, Greenfield strategy. In one such way, you can think of Fiat acquiring Chrysler and then selling uh, Fiat into the United States. Uh, and acquisitions, of course, are quicker, uh, and they can, you, you can kind of get a jump on and preempt, preempt your, uh, get ahead of your competitors, um, and they can be less risky than a greenfield venture. However, acquisitions are not always successful because it's a difference. You're buying another com company, so you may overpay for that because it's really more expensive to have an acquisition than to build your own business. And you may not be able to meld your business with the acquisition or, um, too easily, and it's just the culture, um, you know, the resentment, or it just may not fall together correctly. And, and sort of like, I think Chrysler was also paired up with Daimler, a German uh, automotive company that divested themselves from Chrysler because they just couldn't get that acquisition to work due to cultural and um, managerial differences. Um, and of course this can be reduced the more careful you are in your screening and, and the due diligence you do um, can definitely help the better you have an implement the better organized under your implementation of your uh, acquisition the more chances you have of being successful now uh, Greenfield which is sort of building up from brand new uh, they allow a firm to make the type of company or subsidiary that they want exactly. I mean, it's slower to establish, you know, because um, think of either buying an existing diner or, or having to build and create your diner from scratch, you know, and there's no real track record in it, you know, um, entering any competitive market, you're, you're, you're just not gonna have any idea of how this is gonna work or, you know, um, any predictability of sales of products where if you buy an acquisition, you have that country, con company's long history to really reflect upon and know, get a good idea of how things are going to go. So it's much more of a risk to do a greenfield venture. Okay, so that is chapter 13, and that concludes our, our lecture series on global business today. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you.